forward. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm really excited that Katya and Camille have brought the topics today um, because both of them were super interested in the world of blended finance and transition finance. And we thought that it would be a really great way to combine these two important aspects of impact investing and have both of them share a bit of the knowledge and experience that they've been getting. Plus, we'll have a discussion as it relates to the topic. Um, so if you're watching this online, don't um, be scared to reach out to Katia, Camille, or myself. Um, and I'm going to post in the chat and in our Google Drive the resources that they've prepared so that we can go deeper into the topic. Um, with that, let me hand it over to uh, Katia. And you can give a quick quick inter um, introduction to yourself, where you are, and what you do, so that uh, the other fellows can get to know you a little bit better as well. Um, and then. After your presentation, Camille, you should introduce yourself as well. Okay, yeah, great. Thanks. Um, also, a warm welcome from my side. Um, first of all, sorry for my accent. I'm German, and sometimes I think you can hear it when I'm speaking English. Also, it's been a long time that I haven't really spoken English, so I might make mistakes here and there. But yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, I just graduated from my master's in development studies at the University of Bayreuth. And today I'm actually going to present the topic of my master thesis, which was blended finance for renewable energy projects in sub-Saharan Africa as an instrument of development cooperation. So let me share my screen to share my presentation. Does it work? Can you see the big presentation without any notes? Great. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Okay. So yeah, it was actually my thesis that led me to this fellowship because while writing my thesis, I figured out like I was concentrating on the development finance institutions and on the public side of financing. And then I figured out that the private sector actually has an important role to play as well as impact investors. So when Stephen posted the fellowship in our Oikos WhatsApp group, I was like, wow, that sounds great. I want to learn more about that side of the equation. So what I want to do today is to walk you through the basic concepts in the planet finance discourse, which is of growing importance in the development finance space. Why is, ah, now it's moving. Okay, great. Yeah, so what I'm going to do first is to give you a quick overview of planet finance definition. Then we're going to explore the narrative um, characterizing the planet finance discourse. Then we'll move on to the actors and instruments. And my last step will be to provide some examples for a quick reality check. And then Amir will add to these examples from his experiences. Um, feel free to ask questions in the chat or just save them later for the discussions. Um, I also encourage you to be critical about the concept. I didn't include the critical voices myself in the presentation, but there's a lot to be critical about as well. So let's start off with like the basic definitions of the concept. Blended finance is super hard to define actually because there are various organizations and all have their own um, definition of blended finance. There is for instance, the Development Finance Institutions Working Group, the World Bank, the OECD, and there are think tanks like Convergence in the space and they all define blended finance differently. Their definitions vary a bit between what types of finance are mobilized, whether it's only commercial finance or also public finance, and what types of finance are used um, to mobilize additional finance. For example, whether it's only public development finance provided at concessional terms, or whether it can also be finance provided at market terms, that depends between the um, institutions. So for my thesis, I opted for the definition of the OECD um, due to its broad policy stance and its strategic orientation. It was the one that I could best operationalize for my purpose. And according to the OECD, developmental finance provided by public and private players, such as development finance institutions and philanthropic actors, for instance, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, can be both concessional and non-concessional. So either it's, for example, public development aid, official development aid, or also more uh, market-oriented finance by DFIs that is used to mobilize commercial finance from the private sector. But for today's session, I also included the definition of convergence. Convergence is a major think tank in the space that has also closed industry relations. 
um, and I included it because their definition features the concept of catalytic capital and catalytic catalytic capital um, are financial instruments that are allocated to transactions with the intent to mobilize private sector investment. There is also a broad range of definitions of catalytic capital. For convergence, they only include financial instruments priced at below market terms with the intent to mitigate investment risks and or enhance the returns for private sector participants. This definition also highlights that blended finance is not an asset class, but it's rather a structuring approach. So it's, it's not simply equity or debt, but it's a way to structure finance um, with the view of reducing risks or enhancing the returns or even both of projects. As I said, there's no unified de definition of blended finance and that makes monitoring and yeah, monitoring of how much money goes into blended finance and what the impacts are extremely difficult because um, various institutions collect various types of data. You cannot compare them directly. And also sometimes, especially DFIs like development finance institutions, they are reluctant to publish data at a granular level because they say, oh, we have confidentiality concerns and it's commercially sensitive in information. So it's hard to keep track of it. Then let's move on to the narrative that has become uh, the famous slogan from billions in ODA to trillions in investments of all kinds. Um, ODA means official development aid. And I mean, the need for additional finance for sustainable development is, is beyond question. Um, as we can see here, the OECD has estimated the gap to achieve the SDGs in developing countries at 3.9 trillion US dollars in 2020. I mean, that's an incredible sum that cannot be achieved or filled by official development finance or aid flows. But this gap could theoretically be filled by uh, global finance flow flows because it's just, it's less than 1% of um, global financial assets. So if we can somehow manage to redirect some of these financial flows, we could achieve the SDGs or at least finance them. So the narrative of blended finance is the following. We just need a little bit of public money, say for instance, official development aid or some finance from development finance institutions. And by that, donors can leverage a multiple of commercial investments. Like the slogan says, from billions to trillions. And how is this supposed to work? Um, this graph summarizes the narrative that I just explained. So the blue curve is the supply of commercial finance that's currently available for investment projects contributing to achieving the SDGs. And then you have the intersection of the supply and the demand for finance, which are bankable projects that contribute to the SDGs. As you can see at the first intersection, not so many projects get realized. And that is due to the fact that commercial investors require high risk adjusted returns as they say, oh, it's developing in emerging countries, high risk and so on. Therefore, we require very high returns and not many projects obviously can deliver these returns. So blended finance kind of works as a subsidy. That means that donors use financial instruments to improve the expected risk return ratio so that more projects become investable for the private sector as they are willing to accept lower returns as the risks also decrease. And then we can see the impact of blended finance is basically the increase of the investment projects realized or the additional finance becoming available to projects. So what is crucial for this narrative to work is the slope of the curve. First of all, for the supply of finance um, in times of low interest rates in industrialized countries, which we had during the last decade, the supply of finance can be assumed to be shallow. So it's like flat curve. And this implies that donors only have to, to improve the risk return ratio a little bit, and then a lot of additional finance will be freed up and flow to emerging and developing markets. But as we all know, interest rates in industrialized countries like in the Eurozone and the US have increased recently. And so this assumption becomes a bit more questionable. Secondly, we have the slope of the demand curve, which is the crucial determinant of the impact as well. Because implicitly, proponents of blended finance claim that the demand curve is shallow as well. 
so that a relatively small subsidy by the public sector can push a large number of projects over the threshold of bankability. However, that's what is um, yeah, stated in the literature and it was also confirmed to me in the expert interviews that I conducted for my thesis is that the real bottleneck is not necessarily the financing, but the availability of bankable projects. So by making more financing available, this does not automatically mean that more projects will get realized if there are not enough good projects that the private sector can invest in. So that also points uh, a little bit to the reality check that we will have later, but right now we're moving on to how a subsidy that I just showed in the graph can look like. So as I already said, blended finance is a structuring approach and not an asset class. There is a broad range of instruments used in blended finance structures, for instance, guarantees or insurances to, edu to reduce risks. There's debt and equity, there are grants, there are results-based incentives to increase the returns for private investors. Sometimes these instruments get combined. It's like everything is possible. Um, then there are key mechanisms, for example, subordination. That means that um, donors or development finance institutions invest in the riskier tranches or in riskier instruments like equity instead of in senior equity or senior debt so that they act as a risk buffer to the private sector. Um, this is especially true for collective investment vehicles, especially funds where the donors provide the risk buffers for the private investors to then also contribute to the funds. So there are some instruments that target the risk side of the equation, some increase the expected returns and some address both aspects of the equation. The outputs of blended finance are first of all, um, an increased mobilization of commercial finance through the improved risk return ratio of projects. Then of course, successful project execution that also builds the capacities of the private sector partners. So the assumption is that through getting them to participate in blended finance transactions, they will be able to replicate these projects in the future without further subsidies from the, uh, from the public sector. For funds, if funds are successful and invest in good projects, then the donors can reinvest their public funds on a revolving basis. So it's basically, theoretically, it means to use public finance more efficiently. In the long term, proponents of blended finance expect a reduced need for public development finance as the private sector can take over the provision of services or infrastructure in certain sectors. And also they hope to create markets to help create, uh, make markets evolve and to grow so that um, in the long term, they become investable for the private sector alone. Two key concepts in the context of blended finance are first of all, additionality. That means that is the impact that donors bring about that the private sector alone would not. For instance, there is financial additionality. That means that without the engagement of the donors, private finance wouldn't get mobilized or a project wouldn't get realized. And there is non-financial additionality. This can be, for example, developmental impacts like because a donor gets engaged into a solar project, marginalized groups, for example, nearby communities get connected to the grid, or because a donor gets in engaged, um, the private sector adopts higher ESG standards. Of course, it's incredibly difficult to obtain quantitative evidence on additionality because you would need a quasi randomized experiments of project with donor participation and without which in reality is super hard to obtain. So mostly it's qualitative uh, evidence and just the donors putting forward a narrative saying, yeah, we're additional. The second important concept is leverage. This mostly is applied to the ratio of donor funds to commercial financing mobilized. So for example, for every dollar of donor finance put into the project, we mobilize $5 of private finance. To the narrative of from billions to trillions, high leverage ratios are crucial. I mean, it hinges on the assumption that we can mobilize trillions of uh, private dollars, but this assumption or this, um, yeah, this attempt to achieve high leverage ratios creates also perverse incentives. Because if you tell a development finance institution, 
oh, you need to achieve high leverage ratios, then of course they will go for projects that are already close to bankability and run the risk of leaving um, the countries and the sectors that are most in need of financing behind. So it's a double-edged start a little bit. Then I'll give you a quick overview of the actors that we have in the space. First of all, we can divide the investors in two groups. The first group is investors having a primarily developmental mandate. So they are interested in the development impact. These are donors and their development finance institutions who invest both official development aid and own account resources. Uh, own account resources and philanthropic actors like, as I said, the Bill and Miguel Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And then we have the target group of blended finance with a commercial mandate. These are, for example, large institutional investors like pension funds, insurance companies who have millions and billions of dollars um, of assets under management. And those are the primary target group of blended finance. Then mostly development finance institutions, but also privately managed fine, uh, funds act as the intermediaries for these trans transactions. So they set up the structures and channel the funds into the projects. What is crucial for this equation to work is the regulatory environment. We have, for example, banking regulations, or also um, credit ratings that limit what certain actors can do. For example, a bank is regulated by Basel regulations. They cannot take in a limited risk. If they want to invest in a very risky project, their liquidity buffer has to increase and it's hard for them to do that. And on the other hand, we have enabling factors, for example, nationally determined contributions by, by countries. If they say we want to achieve 50% share of renewables in our energy mix by 2030, then that's a clear signal for investors that there might be a potential to invest in renewables in this country. All right, for my last slide, I'm moving on to some examples of how blended finance structures can look like in reality. Um, in my thesis, I focus on the energy sector, so two of them are energy related. The first example is Climate Investor One, which is a 850 million US dollar blended finance vehicle that is managed by climate fund managers. And climate fund managers is a joint venture between the Dutch Development Bank and the infrastructure specialist Phoenix Works. So Climate Investor One is one big fund that has three sub funds to cover the entire project cycle of renewable energy projects in developing and emerging markets. And they try to address two market barriers. First of all, they raise first loss equity and subordinate equity from donors and aid agencies, as well as DFIs and multilateral development banks, including a guarantee from the Dutch Export Credit Agency. And thereby, they have created an investment setting in which institutional investors feel comfortable to join and to invest in a high risk asset class in which they would normally not invest. And second, thereby these investors can commit to projects at phases in which they would normally not invest, for example, construction or project preparation. Climate Investor One was, is quite successful, like they raised a significant amount of money from institutional investors. And this shows us the importance of aggregation structures like funds. So to say to pool many projects into one vehicle, but it also shows that the risk buffer needed to attract these investors is still quite large. Like I read in the paper, they approached about 300 investors and ultimately secured investments by a handful. So that means we still need a lot of donor money to make this happen. Another example in the renewable energy sector is Get Fit, which is a horribly complicated name beyond this abbreviation, so I will not give it. Uh, which is financed by the German development bank KFW through grant money. So in this really just uh, official development aid, and it has been successfully implemented in Uganda and is currently rolled, being rolled out in Mozambique and Zambia. Get Fit combines risk reduction through close collaboration with the Ugandan authorities in terms of standardizing the documentation for private renewable energy projects with a results-based top-up premium. So it also enhances the return by saying, okay, the Ugandan authorities offer a feed-in tariff for your renewable energy project, and we offer a premium on top of that to enhance the returns. 
but only if the project is operated successfully. Um, Get Fit Uganda is also one of the rare cases where they really have quantitative evidence of financial additionality because they could compare the financial data for projects that successfully applied for the subsidy to those projects that um, did not get the subsidy, but that still went ahead. So they could show how the internal rate of returns differ and that their projects have been financially additional. So GetFit was successful, but still the private finance mobilized was limited to the construction firms and the operators bringing in equity capital, while the debt capital was mostly raised um, from development finance institutions. And lastly, as a relatively recent example, there's the SDG Loan Fund, which was also set up by the Dutch Development Bank, FMO, that for this fund provides the first loss tranche. And then we also have a guarantee by the MacArthur Foundation for Credit Enhancement. The fund is privately managed by uh, Allianz Global Investors and has mobilized 1.1 billion US dollars of investor capital that is supposed to be invested in about 100 high impact loan participations that are supposed to advance the SDGs. So what these examples show us is that there are promising structures, there are approaches that work, um, that mobilize private money, but it also shows that their impact is still far away from the billions to trillions ambition. Um, and also what people told me in my interviews is that it takes a long time to structure such approaches. And now we have 2024, by 2030, we want to have achieved the SDGs. And the question is, are we not running a bit of time with these incredibly complex approaches? OK, now I'm happy. I saw that there was already something going on in the chat. I don't know if there are already some questions. But in any case, I'm happy to answer your questions now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Katia. Um, and also for, for providing these resources and the examples there at the end. I mean, one question that Maria and I had quickly was sort of on the graphs that you provided. And I'd never really thought of it as like putting it into a de demand supply curve of how like blended finance is allowing for essentially a subsidy, right? A reduction yeah. in the price for making this financing available. Um, but your points on the elasticities of these curves, right? The slope of how, how they are. Um, you you mentioned sometimes that they're like flat, sometimes that they're sloping or they're not very steep, but it wasn't clear to us exactly on your diagram. Yeah, let me go, wait, let me go back to the diagram. Um, to get... Yeah, I think this is a, a really helpful point because, yeah. I mean, it's a simple way to explain the the additional benefits for producing the return um, rate. Where's the big screen? Anyways, do you see a graph right now, no matter whether it's the big one or the small one? Yeah, that one. That one, okay. But I think it does the job. So if you imagine that we, oh, well, may, no, maybe I do it differently. Because in my thesis, I got both with different slopes. Maybe that's okay. a easier to explain and I have my thesis open here as well. Just let me move to ah yeah yeah I got it. The colors are not as nice as uh in my presentation but you have the direct comparison. Um, Is it coming? Yes do you see, no, where's it? It says shared screen, but I can't see the green. What can you see right now? We're seeing two graphs. Okay, One... you're seeing two graphs, great. So you can see here, I will write the slope of the demand curve. And what the case in reality, at least in the energy sector, is the case of the right graph. So we have a very steep demand curve. There are very few bankable projects. And as you can see here, if we put in the same subsidy, the impact decreases, like the subsidy doesn't help to get much more projects realized because mm -hmm. the private sector still says, oh no, the risk is too high. We can get better returns elsewhere. Um, whereas if the demand curve is 
um, more shallow, then we have a bigger impact when we put in the same subsidy. Mm -hmm. And obviously the same here, if you would increase the slope of the supply curve, because for example, the interest rate increase in industrialized countries, then the impact also gets smaller. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because essentially it's more expensive for those projects to get financed. Yeah. Kind yeah. of what we're seeing now in the development space that there's been a slowdown. Yeah. Does this answer your question? Maria. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. Perfect. Um, Camille brought up a good point about calling it really a subsidy or um yeah, or is it the targeted support of these investments through debt instruments? Sorry, Kai brought that up. Maybe Kai. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So sorry. Sorry for coming in late. Maybe maybe it was um already discussed before. Um. But I wondered if like we can actually call it a subsidy or if it is more like if, if these funds are more tools um to lower the cost of capital by hedging the risks, etc. Um. So it's kind of related to the question of um ownership and where does the money flow then in the end because i understand that a fund is um giving a loan but then also example, um, yeah. collecting back um profits um from the projects that are financed so um i, I was wondering like a, a subsidy i understand okay i'm giving you money so you um do a good project but then also this money stays in the project while a loan um, from a fund, I understand more that then it's actually flowing back. Um, yeah. so, so I wondered. Um, so the think. subsidy term, I have it from one very specific paper. Um, and since I was um, using economic perspectives to apply blended finance, like the subsidy term um, fitted very well into my concept. And the idea is basically because blended finance improves the risk, risk return ratio for the private sector, in a way that they, like without the engagement of the donors, they would have higher risks or lower returns. That's how this author um, came to the conclusion that it's a subsidy. And for example, you mentioned funds. The issue here, which is also criticized, is that um, the benefits from the fund are privatized. Like they go to the private investors and maybe, okay, the development finance institutions get a small rate of return. But if the fund makes losses, then those losses are socialized by um, the donors who provide the first loss buffers and shield the investors against the losses the fund makes, because otherwise they wouldn't invest. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks. But yeah. I can share the paper with you if you are more interested in why, why the author calls it subsidies. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would love to have a look in the resources if you... Yeah. If you... I think it was, uh, yeah. It was Petty Carter who called it. He also is like the, the paper was very interesting from an economic. You also studied economics, right, Kai? So it might be interesting for you. Yeah, I mean, I, I perceive it definitely as a as a tool um for um raising finance to um projects that are not profitable yet and like sort of shifting the market um yeah i, I think my my question is more like uh overlayered on on, on the question of equity <laughs> all right i know are there any more questions because i know that camille and steven also have something to say on the topic Uh oh, did we lose coming out? <laughs> um, I think what I could say while Camille is coming back is, I mean, first of all, Katia, thank you so much for the overview. I think this provides a really great explanation of how blended finance really draws on these two important pieces of one, having the private sector involved right? Drawing capital from the private sector to accelerate investment in projects, right? Moving from billions to trillions, which is a quote that the United Nations uses a lot 
and other development firms use a lot to say, how do we move from the billions to trillions to make um, addressing our challenges possible? And then the second part about it of like, how do we work together to reduce rates of, um, yeah, the expenses so that this is a, is a deal that investors can come and more money will come in towards it. I think those are the two key things that I'm taking away from it. Um, Camille, you're back. Uh, there was a minor problem and my Zoom uh, got shut out. So, but yeah, I'm back, good to be back. Cool. Would you like to add anything? Sure. Uh, I do, uh, I did gather some material. It's not as elaborate as Katya's. It is something I just gathered in like, today morning so let me allow me to share my screen uh before that i'm kamil i work for undp sustainable finance hub and kai and i have been uh, colleagues before before he uh, moved on from undp uh at undp my work primarily involves uh involves around providing secretariat support to the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group. So G20 is an international forum for all the countries to come and discuss various policy issues. Uh, and then one of the groups there, so it's G20 is an international forum. It has two tracks. Uh, one is Sherpa track, another is finance track. Sherpa tracks are related to more of develop uh, developmental issues and finance tracks uh, has various groups talking about the policy making around financial issues that are global in nature for example uh for example the international financial architecture sustainable finance so sustainable finance working group is one of the groups and and UNDP has the secretariat for that group. Basically, we provide the secretariat support to the countries who are deliberating on all these issues. So my work revolves primarily around providing support. So my experience and my learnings are also influenced from what I have been doing over the course of past year. And uh, I joined when India had the presidency. Uh, and last year, India was trying to focus, and as Katya said, her thesis, uh, and while we were discussing this call, Katya also said that this sector is primarily focused, or this concept of blended finance is prim primarily focused towards energy sector. So during India's presidency, India tried to push the, the boundaries and try to reach out, uh, or try to study how this financing is playing out in SDGs beyond climate or just beyond climate related SDGs. So I'll just share my screen. I can present some quick examples of what all we saw last year happening. And, uh, and as I said, it's not very elaborate a PPT, but I think I do. So just basically, uh, this is what, uh, this is what, can be called as blended finance. These are various stru structuring of finance, as Katya said, blended finance is more of structuring of finance. So this is uh, this understanding of blended finance I picked up from Convergence, who have described blended finance as when you club concessional capital along with the commercial debt and equity, lower the cost of capital, or to provide an additional level of protection. Another structure could be when you provide guarantee as a risk mechanism along with the debt and equity or it could also mean that you have debt and equity or you provide a technical assistance facility or you provide another sort of uh, design grant which helps it's also a sort of technical assistance that you provide to the entire financial transaction so you can understand blended finance as the sort of cushioning that uh, is given to the various stakeholders involved in the financial transaction now coming to the uh, to to the transaction that I referred to, that is SDGs beyond climate. This is one of the transaction. Uh, this is one of the examples of blended finance. Uh, these are Rhino bonds. So as you uh, as we all have heard about that, 
rhinos are getting poached more and more in the African forests. And to propel these conservation efforts, World Bank, which holds a secretariat for the Global Environment uh, Facility, floated these bonds, which we colloquially call rhino bonds. What be uh, this <laughs> this diagram is a bit complex, but I'll, I'm just going to break it down uh, simply. What happened is World Bank floated bonds. These bonds were for $150 million. $10 million out of these $150 million were marked for rhino conservation efforts. So bond investors came in, they pulled, uh, they pitched in $10 million for rhino conservation efforts. However, the global environment facility provided them with a guarantee that if your if your money that you have pulled in results in or if they meet the growth targets that we have set in then we are going to give back 13.76 million dollars to you so in effect this concessional capital that is coming from uh, global environment facility is acting as a risk mechanism for bond investors because this is not a sort of traditional investment that happens so this allows investors to feel a bit more secure with their investment if they do not hit their growth targets then they get back their 10 billion dollars so it's from the uh, uh, again coming from the uh, g from jeff but if they do hit the uh, targets, then they get back $13.76 million. And all of this is uh, verified by third party, uh, third party uh, me measurement system, which uh, as you can see there uh, on the right uh, bottom corner, we have conservation alpha and ZSL as verification agent who do the entire monitoring and evaluation, uh, evaluation of the project. So this is one example where we can see blended finance playing its part in projects beyond climate another interesting uh, project is also the development impact bond that this is a project that happened in india where ubs provided uh funds the the broader target of this project was to get the girls who are falling out of uh, fell out of school to get back to get them back into schools they provided funding to the service provider who then uh, went to the ground, did the entire, uh, did the entire project rehearsal, and then there were we had the outcome evaluator ID inside, who then did the entire monitoring evaluation to study how beneficial was that, and we have the children's investment fund and foundation, which is with the basically philanthropy, who had agreed with UBS that if you pull in so and so money and you if you hit so and so targets, uh. We're gonna give back. Uh, we're gonna give you not just your principal amount, but also the coupon uh, amount on top of that. And in this particular project, the project achieved one sixty percent of its learning target. Basically, they overshot all their uh, all their metrics. So it was a huge, uh, huge success, and uh, something that allowed people to look into this sort of financial structuring more and more. So this was just uh, uh, this is one angle I wanted to bring into our conversation around blended finance, and I think we can move into transition finance now. Unless anyone has any question, no. Um, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think one thing that's really cool about the Rhino bonds is that it's a really great example of where the World Bank has stepped in and said, you know, on top of what we already do, which is securitizing this funding and making like this 150 million bond happen, we're going to add something that has impact related to it. Um, and we had the um, like CFO of the World Bank come and do a presentation with us. Um, I can share with you all that um, example because I feel like her talk her talking about it is going to be really really interesting to you if you want to learn more about how the world bank itself is doing blended finance um so that that's something i can share with you the other example you provide 
Camille, is really interesting because this is one I hadn't known about that UBS was doing around, um, you know, enrollment success. And I think both of these, right, these are both working with a private sector bank or organization. Well, one is work with the World Bank and then they have financing from private sector and then UBS is with the, a private sector bank, right? So they're, they're kind of two different struck, they're two different structures, right? Yeah, there are two different structures and they're not so different, to be honest. Uh, over here in the first in the first example of Rhino Bonds, you had Jeff providing a risk me mechanism or a sort of guarantee to the investors that if you do not, uh, if you do meet the targets, we're going to give you on top of that. If you do not, we're going to give you principal amount back. In this, you have UBS. Uh, you have Children's Investment uh, Fund Foundation assuring UBS or providing a risk mechanism guarantee that if you hit the targets, we're going to give you the agreed uh, return trade. Mm, okay. the, the structures are sort of similar, but we have seen that these structures evolve as and when the needs uh as per the needs of the various stakeholders in India, we had another thing called skill impact bond where we had Michael Susan Dell foundation and I'm forgetting the other outcome funders. So we call these are the outcome funders uh, who got involved uh, with the government of India and floated skill impact bonds where investors came in, pitched in money, uh, to the regulator, funded regulator, who organized these a uh, lot of workshops along with British uh, Asian Trust. What's that? I'm forgetting the name. But yeah. And then they uh, organized these massive workshops uh, for upskilling the workforce. And then uh, eventually then you had this entire financial transaction where government was involved, regulator was involved, outcome funders were involved. And then you also had the the found uh, outcome funders along with the investors mm -hmm. so these financial transactions uh evolve as per the needs of the uh, stakeholders yeah which goes to the point that katya made about how long these deals take to structure um and the fact that you need many different partners working together to make even a small, you know, that's only 10 million. I mean, uh, that the Rhino bond was, right? That went to the conservation uh, efforts. That's that's really small. And what we need to move is trillions of dollars. So the orders of magnitude is is insane. Um, Katya, one thing Kamil brought up, and maybe since you focus on the energy sector, and I think this is where we can sort of draw some differences between transition finance and blended finance, is that would you also say that a lot of blended finance has been focused on the energy sector? It was, I, I tried to get some numbers, which was like, I focused on European development finance institutions and the data in the official OECD system was very scarce. So it was really hard to see how much money went into which sector. And they are currently improving the measuring systems. So hopefully you months or years, we'll get more transparent data. Um, the thing about energy is, I mean, the projects they are having, like they have returned, like you use energy, use energy someone. So that is like a, a sector that is very for planet. And they need to basically address the risks of constructing these projects. But once you have uh, an off taker who is actually paying for the electricity you're producing, um, you can get returns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Which and I think is more difficult in education or health, for example. Right, right. There's that surety. And here, you know, the, at least with the Rhino bonds, I know because the World Bank was able to step in, they were able to do something very innovative because the World Bank was taking that risk to create something. And that's something that, um, Heike, the World Bank, um, director that I mentioned talks a lot about is that it, without the World Bank, it wouldn't have been possible to create something like this. Um, maybe Diane, would you like to share a little bit about what you're working on with this uh, small scale Fisher's bond? 
do you, would you call it blended finance? Does it involve the private sector at all? Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, it involves the private sector, right? But I think what's good about it is that um, the private sector now um, is really looking at um, more strategic ways of um, really spending their uh, philanthropic funding. So um, uh, it's actually a private sector who funded the technical feasibility of that uh, uh, impact bond for small-scale fisheries. So there are actually only 253 of it, and we're hoping that ours will be the 254th and first for small-scale fisheries. So, um, yeah, what's what's really uh, what's really interesting or challenging is really uh, really pitching the idea because, like, now after a year worth of um technical feasibility study, we have we have uh concluded that it's technically feasible, and the fundraising is actually the 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 more challenging part. So um, we have, I think uh, for investors, because if you notice the impact bond has like two sets of uh, transactions. So investors, uh, it's not really that hard uh, to pitch, but uh, for outcome funding, that's where we're we are, we are a bit uh, uh, like struggling because of course, as outcome funders, you do not really earn uh, there you not you do not earn from the transaction. It's just really um um strategic way uh for you to um allocate uh, some of your philanthropic money um to ensure that it really um uh, has the impact. So for ins uh, for pure philanthropic money, uh you you give money to like an organization. So whether they reach your outcomes or not, um. Uh, you do uh, you, you can't do anything about it uh, but for for uh, outcome funding uh, for outcome based funding so uh, in the event that they reach and then there's this really strict uh, as mentioned by Camille that, that the there's like strict um, verification of the outcomes then uh, you really uh, have to pay uh, the investors but what's good about it is that you really pay for real impacts not just perceived uh, or sometimes made up uh, impacts. Well said, thank you, it's very interesting. Um, Camille or Katya, would you like to respond? Um, yeah, I can add on that because I, I read one paper where the authors discussed whether you should do, for example, outcome-based financing to really incentivize the private um, operator of the solar park, for instance, to build like good quality projects to make sure that the electricity is produced and so on. But basically the counter argument for the electricity sector is that those people need the money up front for the construction of the solar park. So this is like, it really depends on the sectors which instruments work. And for example, the Get Fit program managed to kind of balance these, this conflict as they said, okay, um, the operators get half of the subsidy when the project um, gets operational so that they're, um, so that they have money up front before the operation, before the actual operation starts. And then they get the rest of the subsidy over the course of five years if they successfully produce electricity. Mm -hmm. And also now for, for Zambia, for instance, and Mozambique, they included a competition component into the tendering for the subsidies. So for Uganda, every project that applied successfully got the same subsidy. And now for Mozambique and Zambia, they said um, the operators applying for projects or that they say, I want to build a project, I don't know, at this river and so on, small hydropower. I need this and that amount of a subsidy for my project to be economically viable. So this way they are trying to be more efficient and not just providing flat subsidies to everybody. Mm -hmm. Amil, would you like to add something before we wrap up? No, no, nothing from my end. I'm good. Yeah. I liked your I like the slides that you made, and I think it might be helpful to share them with the others of seeing the different structures as outlined by confluence and also the um, deeper dive in the 
examples that you provided. I think one thing that I can say, um, also connecting this back to other resources that are available to you. So the interview, interview um, a week ago, two weeks ago with Atark Milling from UNDP is really good because there he's going deeper into what blended finance is um, and hits on a lot of the points that Katya and Kamo were making. Um, but if you wanted to look more on the transition side, go back to the interview with Yuki Yashi from the Global Financial Alliance on Net Zero, which is focusing on transition finance. And um, as both Katya and Kamo and also Diane and, and kind of showed is that like, there's, there's some overlaps between the, these two different terms. Um, and it's quite confusing in the language because blended finance is focusing so much on this transition to net zero, is trying to get um, organizations to adopt, adopt electrification and, and find projects that we can put money towards. But like transition finance has this very narrow definition and it's that first keyword on, on transition that projects are focused towards. So if you think of it as a circle, transition finance is going to be within blended finance. Oftentimes, transition finance often has public and private partnerships together working on public energy projects, um, but they don't have to be. As some um, funds from the public sector have developedly targeted this um, electrification of their economies. Um, but then that sort of depends, I think, a lot on how the energy structure of the country is set up, whether it's a private or public market, um, and how much investment there is in that public market from the private sector. So it gets quite confusing. But if you if you do check out, I'll put in the chat um, the Google Drive that I set up for today's call, which has um, the presentations and the information in there. And I'm gonna add Katia's latest version um, so I'll just put it in the chat and you can check up for those watching the recording, you can go to our Google Drive and find it. Um, but there's a really good report in there from Green Green Money, um, from sorry, from the Green Finance Institute about transition finance. And I have to go in a few minutes, but you all could stay on and keep chatting if you'd like. Um, but the, the thing that I'll leave you with here is that what this transition report is really highlighting and they're and they're bringing up the mission of G fans. They're bringing up the mission of y of Yuki Yashui and the others of how we don't have enough time to sit back and sort of look at this definition difference and say, what is blended? What is transition? How do we define what green money is? How do we do this? Like this, these are debates that are happening within spaces that and that are very philosophical, that are very um, technical, that are very like revolving around scientific papers. And, and Katya brought that up about the additionality of these projects, that it's very hard for us to prove on a financial basis how well blended finance is doing because we just don't have controlled studies to say the additional money that you're saving by doing this public-private partnership um, is good for the market, right? And I think that's what comes down to this for me is that we are really trying to make this problem be so market oriented in the way we talk about it. And we really don't focus on the positives of the impact. Like they get outweighed by the fact of how do we address this risk, this risk um, part of it. And we don't talk enough about, oh, we're, pre we're preventing the deaths of of thousands of rhinos. We're educating more girls. Um, we're providing access to electric electricity. Like these are the things that are unquantifiable, <laughs> right? They're un they're not possible for us to say in financial terms. And so this is one thing that the report says is that like the movement of billions to trillions of mobilizing capital to get us away from these fossil fuel dependent industries and these companies that are not going to change many many of them it, you would have to have a transformation of their business models to move us to a net zero target um it's kind of slowing us down and really what we have to do is really focus on this impact first and moving money towards projects 
Now that's a lot easier said than done and the report brings this up that we, are, we don't have a pipeline of projects, we don't have enough um, actors making the change happen locally, but we're, we're kind of getting lost in the weeds. We're kind of getting mixed up in the conversation that we're having. So I think that, yeah, Kamel and, and Katia and, and the others here on the call, you all brought up really good examples of, of understanding the dilemma that's there. <laughs> um, I'd be happy to hear what the rest of your thoughts are before we, we call off. I can, I can stay on the call for a little bit longer, um, but I want to give a big thank you to Katya and, and Kamal for um, yeah, being brave enough to share a bit about what they're working on and researching themselves. It, it adds a lot, I think, to the, to the program, hearing it directly from you um, and how much you have to offer in this. So thank you very much. Thanks for providing the platform for this. <laughs> I was happy that my master thesis was just not read by my supervisors, but also I was able to share a bit of the knowledge I accumulated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And on that note, um, if you want to read Katia's uh, thesis and go deeper with it, she'd be happy to talk about it. Yeah, mm. please just reach out to me. Um, I don't want to to upload my thesis to the Google Drive folder because um, for for kind of data protection reasons of my interviews, even if there are no names and so on, but I'll be happy to share it with whomever is interested in it. Nice. nice. <laughs> All right, Kamil, thank you so much. Take care of yourself. Glad you're here. Thanks, everyone. I have to go too. Bye bye. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. The recording is going on.